Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to the Law and Crime Network. I'm your host, Jesse Weber, and thanks for joining us today. We are continuing our two major cases that we've been covering this past week as well as last week. This is the case of Todd Kenhammer out of Wisconsin and the case of Xavier Dobson out of Tennessee. Now, we should note that the Xavier Dobson case will start at around 9 a.m. today, and the Todd Kenhammer case will begin again at 1030. Let's first talk about the Todd Kenhammer case. <clears throat> So again, this case is about this Wisconsin man who was being charged with fatally beating uh, his wife of 25 years. You see them there, right, right there. And the police and investigators believe, and the state is trying to prove, that he covered it up, that he covered up this murder as a car accident. You know, Mr. Kenhammer claims that a pipe went through his windshield and struck Barb in the head, uh, which caused her injuries that resulted in her death. He said the pipe fell off of a flatbed truck that was passing by, and the defense is really trying to say this was an accident. Well, what did we see yesterday? We saw the defendant take the stand. That's right. Todd Kenhammer took the stand yesterday in really, really interesting and compelling testimony. Uh, I mean, it really was something to watch. We're going to play replays of it today and talk a little bit more about it. But in case you missed it, as you can expect, Mr. Kenhammer vehemently denied having anything to do with Barb's death. In fact, he was asked directly, did you take her head and bash it against the wheel rim? He said no. Did you take a pipe and beat her in any way? No. Did you hit her in the face with the Bubba mug? No, which again was a mug in the car. And they even said, have you ever hit your wife? He says, I never even raised my voice to Barb, never hurt her either. Now, let me tell you something. The problem with Mr. Ken Hammer's, uh his uh, testimony is that some of it might have been a little too outrageous. The idea that saying that you've never even raised your wife, uh, raised your voice to your wife in over 25 years, that might have been a little bit difficult for the jury to swallow. And in the end, they have to dissect what is true and what is not. And he faced a very, very difficult cross examination by the prosecution where they, he could not explain a lot of details about what happened in the car, why, how the pipe actually came in, where, how the pipe was in the way, why he threw the pipe away, how he got Barb out of the car. He couldn't explain a number of her injuries. I mean, at one point, let's not forget in his interrogation tape, he couldn't even talk about why her injury, how she was able to have so many injuries and maybe it wasn't all caused by the pipe. Um, and let's not forget, he was also questioned about what he was doing that day. If you remember, he and Barb were in the car on their way to someone's house to try to fix a windshield. And you remember, his story kind of flip-flopped a little bit about where he was going that day. But at the end, he said, I was going to somebody's place to replace their windshield. They didn't know I was coming. I hadn't spoken to them. And I'm not even sure where they lived. You can see how that might be a little strange. Coupled with the fact that Barb was supposed to go to work at 8 a.m., and she had not been late. Uh, she had not been showing up to late. And you, if we looked at her court record, her work records. She had never showed up to work really at 8:30 uh, a.m. And Todd had said to her, to, to uh, the state that well, she had shown up regularly late or she'd shown up late, and that wasn't necessarily true. So he was backed into a corner about why was she late that day? She had never even called work that day to let them know that she was gonna be late. She had called her mother every day, and she didn't call her the day of the accident. It raises questions about what was going on. We're gonna talk about the Todd Kenhammer case a little bit later, but I do wanna focus on the Xavier Dobson case as well. Again, this is the case of this young 15-year-old boy, a high school football player, who was gunned down. He was killed and shot when he was protecting his friends from gunfire. Three men are on trial right now, Christopher Jerome Bassett, Richard Gregory Williams III, and Kipling Colbert Jr. These three men are on trial. The state rested their case yesterday. So now it becomes a question, what will the defense do? And here to help me talk a little bit more about that, I'm joined by criminal defense attorney and former federal prosecutor, Eitan Goldman. Eitan, good to have you on the program. Thanks, Jesse. Thanks for having me. Of course. So let's talk a little bit about what the state has done. You thought that how, what do you, if you could just explain to our viewers a little bit in summation, how do you think they presented their case against each of these defendants? Remember, the three separate defendants, three different levels of evidence. We saw some strong evidence against certain victims, certain uh, defendants on certain days and others on other days. How do you think they've done? You know, I, th I think that's important to keep in mind that the jury is going to be asked to render verdicts on each charge against each defendant, and we very well could see a mixed verdict where they convict one or two and, and acquit or can't reach a, a verdict on the other. You know, the, the evidence against these three men, uh, I wouldn't say that the prosecution's case is overwhelming against uh, any of them. You know, as criminal defense lawyers, we never 
guarantee victory in any trial. Cases are just triable or not triable. And I think th th this case is triable. I mean, you don't have an eyewitness who, you know, can point to any of these defendants and, and say that they're the ones who actually uh, deliver the shot that, that, that killed Zavian. Uh, and in fact, I think the, the government and the defense agree that none of these three uh, were the kind of primary, uh, um, the, the primary actor in the shooting, that it was a guy named uh, Brandon Perry who was killed about four hours later in another shooting that night. Yeah, let's try to make this a little bit clearer for our audience. Is this gang-related, or is this about a girl? You know, I think there's a back and forth about what the motivation was behind this shooting, and that day was riddled with various shooting incidents. So maybe if you could explain to our viewers a little bit uh, about what is the prosecution saying and what will the defense have to argue against? Yeah, the, 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 the prosecution says this was gang-related, right? And they have that rap video where they, they have the defendants wearing gang colors. And according to them, this is, you know, one of those kind of escalating tit-for-tat shootings where earlier in the day, uh, you know, there was a, a gang affiliated with the Bloods, there was a gang affiliated with the Crips, and there was a shooting on the, the Bloods territory earlier in the day. So this was the Bloods retali retaliating, just going over to Crip territory and basically, you know, spraying a bunch of uh, kids hanging out on the stoop. Um, the defense says, no, no, th this shooting happened, but it was really related to a girl Brandon Perry's girlfriend was insulted by his uncle, and so this was a revenge shooting for that. I don't really know how much it matters whether this was gang-related or um, or a beef that just escalated about a girl. And you know, as, as some of these some of these you know, cases involve gangs, but involve disputes that are actually uh, related to some kind of minor. Um, uh, not even some kind of minor slight where you know somebody takes offense because you disrespected a member of his family or 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 a girl or or a friend i think that what actually matters is whether or not the government these three individuals to this particular shooting and you know you saw um or heard uh, the tape from the uh, officer who got wasn't really a confession, but he got a lot of admissions out of uh, the defendant Bassett, who, you know, initially said he wasn't anywhere near. Then he said, okay, I was near, but I didn't shoot. Then he said, okay, I shot, but I shot in the air. You know, he hasn't admitted firing the, the fatal shot, but he's come, you know, pretty close to uh, satisfying the government's burden of proof just with his admissions. We'll talk about that fatal shot because I think there was a firearms expert that took the stand yesterday a clip of that in a moment, but I actually, we've been showing you, um, our viewers, this rap video, and uh, Eitan, you spoke about it a little bit. What do you make of that rap video in terms of, well, the defense, if, they, if these men are convicted, is that prime for an appeal, the fact that this was shown to the jury, um, showing potential gang affiliations, as you said? And I remember the defense really didn't want this in in the first place. They tried to say, hey, uh, well, if you include this in, in the record, it's going to chill free speech. It's going to chill the artists out there who want to make rap videos that, uh, you know, that they might be used against them later on in a court of law. What did you make of this whole rap video issue? I mean, I think that the, the, there's nothing wrong with the government putting in the, the evidence of uh, the rap video to show gang affiliation. Um, the whole, you know, First Amendment argument is, is really a stretch. I don't clear why society should be concerned about, you know, chilling uh, this kind of speech. No one is, is, is saying you can't make a rap video, but if, or no one's saying you can't make public statements, but if, if, if that is evidence of some kind of affiliation or some kind of motive to commit a crime that you're charged with, um, I don't see any power at all to the defense argument that this should not be allowed, and I don't think that's a risk on appeal should the government prevail in the um, let's talk a little bit about this firearms expert that testified yesterday, Patricia Rezig. One of the things she mentioned was that uh, she said cases found that the Lionsdale shooting matched a 40 caliber pistol found under defendant William's seat during a traffic stop in January of 2016. Uh, she testified that this gun shot the bullet that killed Dobson. Eitan, stand by. We're going to play some of her testimony from yesterday, and then I would love your thoughts. Okay. I think the reporter knows how to spell it. Todd Allen Kendhammer. How old are you, Mr. Kendhammer? 47. 
And where were you born? La Crosse, Wisconsin. And uh, were you raised in La Crosse? Yes, I was. Have you lived here all your life? Yes, I have. Where'd you go to school? I went to Logan High School, Logan Middle School. And when did you graduate from high school? 1988. What were the names of your parents? Robert and Patricia Kendhammer. And uh, has your dad passed away? Yes. Is your mom still living? Yes, she is. Is she here in the courtroom? She's sitting in the second row. Ms. Rosick, will you look at the diagram that is to your left with the yellow, green, white, and red on the same? We can bring that over. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. bring that over. Yeah. We're just trying to get an angle where I can sit by the I'm going to block the diagram and you do that as well. I'm going to do that. Okay. Ms. Resick, that diagram reflects the 34 cases that you were presented with from the Lonsdale shooting, correct? Yes. And relative to those casings, you rely upon the evidence text to mark and record where the actual casings were picked up. What I rely on is their evidence marker number. So if their evidence marker number is, say, three, that would become my Q. Right. And so when we go back through there, we not only have an evidence marker number, we have a Q number. And now here today and over this past week, these are also designated with exhibit numbers. Correct? Yes. Okay. I mean, you've been asked to look at the envelopes with the specific cartridge cases in them. And relative to the colors that are on the diagram, I think that marks the you know, step over here. So if we see that, exhibit 520, those colors correspond then to the colors that you've utilized or that the state as utilized in the outlines on this big chart. Is that right? Just the red and green. Right. Okay. The, the yellow, the outlier, if you will, that we're not sure where it came from. Do we have it listed on the chart? Yes. It's the one fired for us in Western Caliber City. Right. So that being said, we don't, as we sit here today, know from which range of manufacturers that that cartridge case came from, do we? Uh, no, no, no. I, well, I apologize. You're right. Range of manufacturers of cartridge cases, we know because it's got a list in there, right? But we've talked about what guns that possibly discharge that particular cartridge case, and that's our unknown, right? In that case, yes. Okay, that one case, and so when we say yellow, we know unknown, right? Yes. Okay, and when you have described the possible weapons relative to the discharge of cases, we know that the 11 casings, which are noted on Exhibit 520, I'll write myself a note here. through your testing correspond to the 9mm pistol which has been filed in which the judge made sure was safe and that you examined that is exhibit number 575. Is that correct? I don't remember what exhibit is, but are you saying that the red... The, the, the red Corresponds to 9 millimeter casings. And then on the big, if you will, diagram, I realize I can't see that, you can see up at the top, 
That's the nine millimeter that you've notated was recovered somewhere in the close vicinity of 1871 Hazen Street, correct? That's correct. What date is listed with regards to that recovery, ma'am? 4-14-2016. Chronologically, at least three to four months after December 17, 2015. Is that right? Yes. Okay. And of the 34 cartridge cases found at the scene, then that eliminates 11 because we know they go to that gun. Correct? That's correct. All right. Now, the other cartridge cases left because if we eliminate 11 from 34 cartridge cases, that leaves us how many cartridge cases? 23? Okay, I'm not, I'm not trying to be tricky or with your math. Now, of the 11, excuse me, the 23, we know that 11 listed in green that you found at Lonsdale correspond to exhibit number 576. And that is the Smith & Wesson 40 caliber pistol. Yes, sir. Okay. So we've now eliminated 11 and 11 22 of those 40 caliber rounds as being unknowns. We know that they went to the Smith and Wesson and we know that they went to the 9mm Springfield pistol, right? Yes, sir. Okay, so if we take 11 and 11, that's 22, and that leaves us with 12, right? From 34? Yes, sir. Okay, and from 34, we know that we have this, and I, I'm, I'm going to call it an outline, I do not know what the appropriate name is, this one casing that we don't know other than the fact from the head stamp that it's a 40 caliber. You, you show me here, yes? Yes. Okay. So then we take that one away, that leaves us 11 cartridge cases that are unexplained, at least as far as having a match from a gun standpoint, correct? They're identified as having fired in the same thing gun. The same unknown gun, and that gun could be a Smith & Wesson or a Glock, right? Smith & Wesson Sigma Series or a Glock, correct? Right. And do you know how many Smith & Wesson Sigma Series Guns are in Knoxville, Knox County, Tennessee. Yes. Do you know how many Glocks are in Knoxville, Knox County, Tennessee? Yes. It's fair to say that Glock manufactures several guns, Model 27, Model 22, that take a 40 caliber round, right? Yes. And in fact, Relative to that 40 caliber round, you mentioned 40 10 millimeter. Would you explain for the jury what you're talking about when you describe, not cases, but 40 10 millimeter, when you talk about those two rounds in close proximity to one another? Again, when I say 40 slash 10 millimeter, because of the diameter of the 40 and the 10, and also because of their weight, Unless I have a gun that I can positively identify it to, I have to call it that. Until I get the gun, now when I get the gun, then I can say, yes, it was the, that is a 40 Smith and Wesson caliber bullet because it was fired in the 40 Smith and Wesson caliber. Welcome back to the Law and Crime Network, everybody. This is Jesse Weber. So that was the testimony of Knoxville Police Department's firearm expert, Patricia Rezig, in the Zavian Dobson case. And now, what is, why is her testimony so important? Well, she said that several guns, um, well, several guns have been presented during the trial. And what she said that the cases found at the Lonsdale shooting matched a 40 caliber pistol found under Williams' seat, defendant Williams' seat. During a traffic stop in January of 2016, she testified that this gun shot the bullet that killed Dobson. She also said that cases found at this shooting and the Green Hills apartment shooting, remember there were two different areas of the shooting, came from a 9mm pistol. 
She concluded the 9mm pistol was the same gun used to shoot Larry North, who was a witness to Dobson's murder. And Williams was convicted in April of shooting North. You see how this is all connected. I'm joined by criminal defense attorney and former federal prosecutor Eitan Goldman. This is some crucial testimony for the prosecution and not so good for the defense. Am I correct? You are correct. Uh, it's kind of an understatement. I mean, this is the primary piece of forensic evidence tying the defendant Williams uh, to the murder. And, you know, his lawyers have uh, an ability to push back. I said, well, you know, it was, the gun was found in his car you know, a month later. It doesn't show that he was a shooter. I don't think there's any evidence of uh, fingerprints on the gun. And in any case, you know, that wouldn't prove that he was the guy who pulled the trigger yeah, that shot. They, one of the interesting things in this case is that there were a lot of shots fired and only one. 34 hit. shots, I believe. Yeah, yeah, these people were not particularly good shots. Or if you, you know, believe uh, Bassett's um, uh, story to the police, uh, at least one and maybe some of the shooters intentionally aimed high because they didn't want to hit anybody. Um, so it doesn't show who the trigger guy is, but it certainly ties Williams more tightly into the shooting that night. So the defense is going to be starting their case today. We expect at any moment. You're, you're a great defense attorney. What would you do in this kind of case? What is the way, what is the avenue for maybe at least one of the defendants to try and get out of this? What is their strategy moving forward? What kind of witnesses will they call? Uh, you know, we don't know what kind of witness. I think that Bassett has one witness that he's going to call, and I have not heard who that witness is. And I think that the other defendants aren't going to call anybody. And that's, you know, not a, uh, an a, a unconventional strategy. All three defendants have already indicated that they don't intend to take the stand. And you Were know, you surprised by that? Were you surprised that they didn't take, take the stand? No, no. I mean, the, the overwhelming majority of cases that I've tried, the defendants don't testify. And the cases where that I've seen defendants testify... Uh, nine times out of ten, the government's case gets stronger because, you know, then cross-examination, if the defendant's telling a story that's not true and he's told different versions before and he says something that's either not credible on its face or somehow able to be disproved, you know, once a jury looks at a defendant, you can throw the burden of proof, you can throw beyond a reasonable doubt, you can throw everything else out the window, they're probably going to convict the defendant just because the guy lied to them and they figure he's a liar, he probably did it. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. You know, we saw yesterday, and we're going to play a clip of it in a little bit, um, when the medical examiner was able to determine that the bullet that actually struck uh, Xavier Dobson, it basically corroborated the story from witnesses that he was a hero, that he jumped in uh, and tried to protect uh, these these girls. It's really, really a sad thing to see, right, Eitan, just to see that the, this, it, it mapped up, you know, it mapped up the fact that he, she, he got shot the way that they said. And that's what makes this such a, you know, compelling human interest story. I mean, we see gang violence all the time, right? Chicago's had 600 some murders this year. But here, I mean, the, the kid who got killed wasn't involved in gang violence. He was just, a, you know, a civilian. And um, he, you know, uh, died uh, heroically. So I think that's what kind of has, is, is responsible for the public interest in this particular murder. Yeah, I remember, uh, you know, everybody who's following this case, this was featured on a 30 by 30 documentary of this young boy, President Barack Obama, very highly of his uh, heroism. And now these three men are on trial. You see right there, Xavier Dobson, this is from President uh, Barack Obama. Uh, Xavier Dobson died saving three friends from getting shot. He was a hero at 15. What's our excuse for not acting. Really, really sad stuff. I, I do want to play a little bit of the uh, testimony from Dorinka Mulesnik, the chief medical examiner uh, who testified. You can hear you can hear about this bullet wound that uh, ultimately um, Xavion succumbed to his injuries and died from. So I want to play you this. And again, it is consistent with the story that this young man was a hero. He was caught at the wrong time, the wrong place. And it's really, really a shame. So let's play some of this testimony.